course, we'll start. Um, yes. <laughs> brave to come out this morning. It's such a, yeah, it's so hard to see. Right. Um, so it's good we're having this one videotape because. All right, we're very glad that you came all the way down this morning in this soupy, soupy weather. Um, and this is Todd Menes. Just make sure I'm pronouncing that right. Minis. Todd Menes. 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 Yeah. Menes. All right. And Todd is the river engineer for the state. And one of six. Scott Jensen actually has this district. I used to have this district. Okay. Uh, so, appreciate the opportunity to come down and have a conversation. And is anybody here? Did I meet anybody here after Irene in the Irene response? Okay, I know I did meet Lee. Um, Quarry Road culvert, and we'll have that in here. Um, a slide, a couple slides of that. And I've got six sections here. This is part one. Various weather observations, my personal observations. I'm not here to try and convince anybody about climate change, free country, you're entitled to your opinions. Um, I believe in it, having lived here for so long. Um, and so I talk too much. Let's get going here. You know the saying, if you don't like the Vermont weather, just wait five minutes. This is a picture of Lake Champlain. This is the Winooski River flowing in. You can see the Winooski River right there. Big sediment plume, right? Now, this was the day after Irene. I don't know if you ever saw a picture of the James River in the Long Island Sound. Same thing, big brown plume, and then the next river over clear. So we're gonna be talking about what our human impacts are to rivers and streams, the eco ecology and the economy, um, society, what, it, what it's doing to us. And this is John Muir about 1902, and he's sitting looking out at the vista and the weather and having a grand old time. And the context for Dummerston. John Muir was a 20th century Scottish American author, naturalist, environmental philosopher, glaciologist, preservationist. And John Muir said, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. So this is very relevant to your town. And my understanding is you're wondering, what do we do for the future with climate change? If you don't believe in climate change, just what is it that we do for flood resiliency? And having seen a lot of damage after Irene, a lot of wrecked lives, um, flood resiliency is something I've been doing a lot of talking about over the years since Irene. So this is a picture of East Dummerston in 1913. I got this off of the um, UVM. They've got a historic pictures website. Went through and found this. So you can see there's some homes, roads, barns, etc. Stream going through underneath the road and a bridge there. And <clears throat> The golden rules do unto those downstream as you would have those upstream do unto you. Okay, this is Wendell Berry. What you do impacts your neighbors, upstream and downstream, believe it or not. Ancient Chinese proverb, I love this one, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The next best time to plant a tree is now. My father's gone. The trees that we planted when I was a kid are still there. Remind me of my father. This is Sunset Lake in Dummerston. Nelson Henderson said, the true meaning of life is to plant trees under whose shade you do not expect to sit. And you might have had riparian buffer plantings in town. You may have some coming up in the future. The good news is you don't need a stream alteration permit to plant a tree. You don't need any kind of a permit in Vermont to plant a tree. Okay, meaning and believing. Global warming is an increase in the overall average temperature on Earth, and climate change is a resultant shift in climate patterns that affect regional landscapes. 
This doesn't mean that the entire world will see warmer weather, but that some places will be warmer, some will be colder, some regions more rainfall, more frequent intense storms, some regions will have less. At the bottom here, some folks think the changes are due to our human activities. Some don't believe so, and other, others don't believe it's happening at all. And this is why I'm giving you my personal observations here of having lived in Vermont since 1976. Snowmobiling, yes. Oh, five minutes, okay. Very good, thanks. Um, our economy is affected by the snowmobile industry contributing 26 billion to the U.S. economy, 34 billion to the Canadian economy. I'm 60 years old and I've had some anecdotal, co co anecdotal comments as I recognize that winter is waning in Vermont. And I'm tired of sand in my driveway this year, I'll tell you what. Our Vermont fishing license sales bring 31 million into Vermont, including bait, tackle, gas, food, lodging, etc. Will this also be hurt by climate change? Some say definitely yes. Now, how more bucolic, how calm and peaceful a picture is this, huh? And fresh dinner. <coughs> NOAA, National Oceanographic Atmospheric Administration. Scott Whittier in Burlington NOAA Weather Service office has noted that Vermont summers are extending one month later into September. All of these things that I've got here, folks, Mary Ellen had invited me maybe two and a half months ago. So as I'm reading the Rutland Herald, I'm, I'm making notes. And I recall 20 to 30 years ago, the snow falls typically in October, mid to late October. You'd have snow covered by deer season, snowy Thanksgiving, and recently we've had a lack of snow cover at Thanksgiving and sometimes none in the past decade. This is a practice called slash and burn for new farming. In third world developing countries, they're cutting down the forests and so you see the ash, smoke, soot. So what's causing this global warming? And researchers report that particulates from volcanoes Greenhouse gases from many human activities or pollutants from slash and burn farming in third world countries, that photo I just showed you, and from coal-fired electricity in the developed world are resulting in decreasing Arctic ice shelves. That causes warmer oceans and changing weather patterns that increase droughts in California as the weather ridges and troughs in the atmosphere, weather ridges and troughs are moving north into the northern U.S. states, Canada, and Alaska. And I love this image right here. 1979 Arctic sea ice extent versus 2015. This is September 1979 and look at the top where the ice shelf extends to land. September 2015. Look at the big gap. Look at the broken up ice flows here. So I saw a presentation by a woman who since 1980 has spent research time up there. Very good presentation. A warmer Arctic. Arctic sea ice observed to be decreasing, predicted to continue. I'm going to get going quick here because I'm losing time. Resultant sea levels are predicted to inundate coastal communities worldwide. I love eating shrimp. This is the main coast. The shrimp industry has reported record low number of shrimp caught in the last 34 years and the state has closed the <coughs> shrimp fisheries. Everything is connected. Ticks and climate change. Insects are affected too. The forest duff layer and snow cover insulates the ticks. It's the dry spring and summers that reduce tick populations. Invasive white hemlock woolly adelgid found 80 to 90 percent mortality rate due to the very cold temperatures. Maybe that will be okay. We have this at our house, our white hemlock look like this. <clears throat> Beautiful Arctic caribou, moose and caribou are having a hard time finding food due to increased snow depths. And increasing ticks are killing moose calves, and this is disgusting. A New Hampshire wildlife biologist last year documented 60,000 ticks on a one moose calf. There's a bull and a cow and lynx and bobcat. Lynx like deep snow 
bobcat less snow. Pine martin likes shallow snow too. So mammals and birds, the bobcat and martin are out competing lynx. And polar bear, arctic fox, arctic marine mammals, waterfowl are also affected. All of these animals in the Arctic are affected. You can change your energy use. We have 60% of our energy use worldwide is in our buildings to make the materials during construction, operations, late, lights, heat, cleaning, future maintenance. My wife and I renovated our home 10 years ago and our heating bill the next year was 80% less. We're, we're now paying 20% of what we used to pay. And uh, whether you believe in global warming, climate change or not, you can save on your energy bills. Put this in here because we're focusing on Dummerson. There's nothing wrong with this covered bridge. I did some permitting on this when it needed repairs after Irene. We're just looking to focus on our community. Look at this nice, beautiful picture here with the lake, and the nice fall foliage. I'm sorry, this is actually my town of Plymouth. And so I'm going to say questions for part one. Anybody? Um, when you say that the buildings we have consume 60% of our energy use, yep. um, does that apply to America or the world? Oh, yeah. Yeah, worldwide. Worldwide. Now, if somebody's building a thatch hut in Cambodia, well, there's not much of an energy use there. But this building here is heated, and how often is it used? It's 1847. Has it been insulated since? I would hope so. I'll move on. Okay. So, part two. Oops, I got the. Got to get into. Um, from the beginning. Bingo. Adverse human impacts in weather. So this is a picture of the hydrologic cycle. You can find many of these different images online. We've got the evaporation from water bodies making the clouds. We get precipitation. Some of it goes into the ground and into the be deep bedrock aquifer. Some gets into the soil surficial aquifer, groundwater feeding the stream again. Our forested areas, because the canopies are so big in the summertime for hardwood deciduous trees, that's the leaves are intercepting rainfall. Some of it drips off. It's called flow through, fall through. Some of it hits the leaves, goes onto the branches, down the tree trunk, into the ground get a lot more runoff with grasslands, croplands, and particularly these tilled areas that have not yet been planted, a lot of quick runoff and carrying sediment. So this is somewhere in the 1800s, 1940, somewhere in there. You can see there's some buildings. There's not many trees, all right? This is been historic human impacts, land cover changes have dramatically changed flow and sediment regimes. And at the bottom, between the late 1800s and 1940s, the Winooski River dropped seven feet of sediment on the valley floor. This was documented by the UVM Geology Department. So in the Civil War, sheep farming was very uh, it was a boom in Vermont. Merino sheep, very fine, very water resistant, comfortable, and the Union soldiers were outfitted in Merino wool. This is a bare hill, that's the Capitol building. Behind it, not a lot of trees. And you can see there's bridges and homes. And this is before pavement, which doesn't do us much good. There's a lot of roofs paved roads and parking roads. So there's now more storm water in Montpelier. This picture, I'm looking at the car, this would have been like mid-70s, I guess. And 
those other land uses that I was showing you have pervious surfaces and all these roofs, paved roofs, parking are impervious. All right, so this is a Venn diagram, shapes to show relationships. This is a sustainability diagram. You've got your social needs or impacts in blue. You've got your environmental needs or impacts in green. Economic needs and impacts in red here. And where the economy and environment meet, is it viable? Where the society and the environment meet, is it bearable? Where society and money meet, is it equitable? In that center, overlapping all three of those, is the sustainability bullseye. All of our environmental permitting programs in Vermont, you got to get somewhere in the middle there. And we can hit on stream alteration permits a bullseye right in the center of the target. Win, win, win for everybody. If you've not seen a hydrograph, this is a conceptual flood hydrograph. You've got on that left side going up, flow increasing on the bottom, going this way, time increasing and that curve going up is the hydrograph this piece rising on that side is the rising limb you got the peak crest segment and you get the falling limb or the receding limb and if you've not seen these before i got a couple more to illustrate some points so base flow here is what's coming down out of the valley into the stream through the groundwater table. Here's effects of watershed shapes. Again, a hydrograph, two watershed basins. A has a very long main stem stream. B has a shorter main stem stream. A, the water gets there sooner. It's not as high a peak. The time to the peak is longer. B, you can see the peak is higher, gets there sooner. You combine the two of them and you get A and B combined on the top there. And then affects a floodplain encroachment. Somebody builds a building in a floodplain, raises it up three feet, blocks the flood flows. This is a USGS 1980 paper. And these, again, discharge going up time. These three curves, it's the same amount of water underneath those curves. This lowest one here, before encroachment, think 500 years ago with the Native American Indians and the deer, the bear, the moose. We come over from Europe, wherever, build stuff. The peak gets higher, it arrives sooner, and then upstream. People upstream of you are impacted by this. People downstream are impacted part of this flood resiliency is not encroaching on rivers and streams. Now I'm standing here in front of the Medway Road Bridge in Menden, and I'm doing this. It's a proper size bridge now, reduces flood impacts. That bridge before Irene was about one-fifth of what it is now. They raised the deck, pushed the abutments out. This is the kind of thing that we're looking to do. You're Road Foreman Lee Chamberlain is here. This is Quarry Road in Dummerston. Got whacked by Irene. It was a six foot wide culvert. And this is the plans for the 16 foot wide culvert that's replaced, that's there now. It was a perched culvert. I'm going to get to that later on. In this section view, there's the six footer. There's the 16 footer. It's designed to carry a 25 year Storm return event, flood event, urban landscapes and runoff. A different type of hydrograph, um, sorry, hydrologic cycle diagram. Natural over here, undeveloped. You get a lot of infiltration. You got lake storage, floodplain storage. This half is developed. You get a lot of runoff with pollutant runoff and it's channelized. Everybody wants to get it down into the river really fast as opposed to getting it to in, percolate into the ground. All right. River or stream channel evolution. This is pretty involved. I'm going to breeze through this really quick. 
Stage one up top is stable. Stage five down below is stable. In between stage two, it's down cutting. Stage three, it's widening. Stage four, it's stabilizing, building floodplain. You got three stages of unstable rivers, what our rivers program is looking for. If it's already been destabilized, we want it to get down to stage four, stage five, stable. And where do you live in town? Where do you live in the landscape? My wife and I live up high here in a high valley setting. There's no streams on this, but there are streams and you're going to be living in different locations. Maybe on the side hill, on the flank, down in the valley floor where there's floodplains. And what you do affects your neighbors. Here's stream types in floodplain storage. On the far left, that's that deep valley, narrow where my wife and I live. In the middle, it's showing multiple channels. That's called a braided stream. And down in the valley floor, the meandering large rivers. Our, where we lived is the first floodplain storage. It actually mapped floodplain. And it was perfect in Irene. It was, just where it was. We have nothing down there but horse pasture. You got moderate floodplain and then the largest floodplains down at the bottom. All right. I've heard a lot of people tell me after I read, oh, rivers and streams want to go straight. But no, they don't go straight. They meander over time. The top one is the Little River in Stowe. An image showing where the channel was in 1968, 1994, 2003. Bottom is the third branch of the White River in Randolph. At the top of this, you see 1924, the river was pushed up against the valley wall to build farmland. And then over time, 1939, 1962, 1994, 2003, this is an image showing two different very meandering streams. And can you imagine building your house here? We don't want people to build houses in environments like this. I'm going to get to river corridor management later on. This is setting you up for that. All right, you had the Bagatelle Dam removal in town last year on the east-west road, and just in general, adverse dam impacts. If a run of river on the Connecticut River or West River or other small streams, the adverse impacts include public safety, barriers to aquatic organism passage, AOP includes fish, insects that the fish feed on, reptiles, amphibians, the rodents will go through culverts, bear don't like going over guardrails, they prefer to go through, deer will walk through, bridges, culverts that are large enough, run of river dams are different and have varying degrees of adverse impact and would you define what a run-up river dam is? Okay, yep. Yeah. So if you've got a stream channel, I'm showing you if you're looking at a in an air helicopter at an airport. If you've got a stream channel and the dam and the impoundment are built on the channel, that's run of river or online. If you build a pond to the side and you have an intake and an outlet back, that's an offline pond. Offline, online, runner river, offline. Good question. So Bagatelle was a runner river. It's been removed. It was for ice ponds. We think it was built in 1939, maybe. And there's RL and a red line, river left, a red line, river right. There's a hole in the bottom where they would put in a piece of wood block it for the winter time probably we're swimming in the summertime and here's the post removal this is the same day and there's the river left abutment that was left river right abutment that was left this was state historic preservation office typically leave remnants of it so people in town can see that it used to be there above it there was a historic road stone bridge that was taken out. This is afterwards with the grass growing. 
you can see that the stream can now flow freely, which is balance in nature. And we have a $100 term for that dynamic stream equilibrium. And when I first heard that, my eyes glazed over. Isn't that an oxymoron? I had to think about that a bit. Balance, stream balance. Now downstream on the east-west road, the culvert blocked aquatic organism passage. This is before it was fixed. If you go look at it now, from that big rock down to here, big rocks were put in, it's called a stone weir, and it raises the water elevation and back waters in through the culvert. That drop right there, fish can't get through there. So that's called an aquatic organism passage barrier. It's been fixed with a stone weir. All right, so I put this again in, in here. What can you do in Dummerston? And flood resiliency, um, protecting roads, protecting homes. Crosby Brook has had a phase two SGA, stream geomorphic assessment. Phase one is desktop sitting at a computer. Phase two, you actually go out and look to verify what was on the computer. Desktop analysis, you can go to that phase two SGA. There will be recommendations in there. And at the bottom here, review potential projects in your 2015 Basin 11 plan. That is for the West Williams and Saxons River called the Tactical Basin Plan, and we have consultants that do these, send out a report with recommendations, and then it's up to you folks to implement them. And there's different funding mechanisms. At the bottom, I've got Marie Levesque Caduto's name and phone number here, and she's the basin planner that wrote that and has those funding avenues that she can talk to you about. You know, you've got a project, we want to do this one. And what's appropriate funding mechanism. So, Excuse and... Me, what is phase two SGA, what does that mean? Stream geomorphic assessment. So it's going and looking at the stream and is it in balance naturally? Has it been disrupted by a dam, undersized culvert that's perched? Um, Riprap embankment, a bridge that's causing problems. Okay, so phase one is stream geomorphic assessment desktop. You don't go out in the field, you're gathering all these different resources. Phase two, you take that report and they literally, the consultants literally walk 15, 20 miles of the stream. It takes, it's a lot of field work, so that's why you do the phase one first to identify um, where is it that we want to look, because we can't look at all of this. Well, we'll look at this. 10 miles here, or we'll look at this eight miles here. That's what the difference, stream geomorphic assessment. So end of part two, questions other than Jan's? Yes. Uh, when down at the down road here, when you did the, 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 uh, the removal, the, the, the removal, what I think about was wondering why you left those two pieces there. Is it, did I understand you right that you left the two pieces there so that historically people will know that there was a dam there? Yes. And, I'm sorry? Can you repeat your question? I couldn't. Could you do that more or less? Why can you repeat? My, my question was where they took the dam out down the road, um, down the road, he spoke about, we watched them remove the dam. And then, but we saw that they left two pieces of, con looks like concrete on either side. <coughs> and I was wondering, we kept wondering, why did they do that? Why didn't they take the whole thing out? And what I'm hearing is that if we want a historic record, that it, is it true that those um, that the um, uh, that those would make any difference? They, would they don't. No, they don't make a difference. And so difference. this is why I went back to pre-removal, and the stream is down here. And if you take a look at the vegetation line, that's the top of bank on that side, top of bank on this side. This has been cut out so that it's wider than what. The stream channel needs. This goes down into the West River, but there's no name for it that I could find. So the stream channel is here, and there's a lot more there. It's the bridge abutments have been removed enough that that stream is free to meander through there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the reason you want the stream 
came to me under through there is proficient to keep the seven from backing up. Right. Okay. And then in flood times, that's backing up all the water. This was an encroachment on the hydrograph in the floodplain. Now it's been removed, so there's less impacts downstream of future floods. And Jan? Yeah, I had a question about the renewable dams. Uh, over on my side of the river in New Hampshire, there's been some debate about certain, in certain instances, a dam that's been there so long like for 100 or 200 years, that, it's, that a whole network has, of wetlands has built up behind it. There's arguments that, you know, not breaching every dam is not necessarily the case, that the, uh, this is not necessarily an improvement. Because if, if the whole ecosystem has altered upstream from that dam, to remove that dam would drain those valuable wetlands. Yep, and so, that short answer is, we live in an imperfect world. It's an imperfect world, okay? There was no impact before we put it there. Um, there's wetlands that enlarge. They were always there, but they'll enlarge. So when you take a dam out, do you affect the hydrology of those wetlands? They need water to function as a wetland. So there's a trade-off. Very politically global, worldwide. Did you have a question? Yeah. So far, you've talked about the structural uh, impacts that we have on water flow. I wonder, I mean, I remember a few years back reading that the Crosby River was the most polluted waterway in Darmstadt. Just something from I'll the I'll take your word for it. Yeah. Okay. I, I wonder if you're going to talk about pollutants in streams as well. Maybe that's not a problem in our area. But, um, yeah. So. I've got two hours, I've got six topics, okay. and I'm just barely getting into water quality. Um, I've already mentioned two aspects of it, yeah. the runoff and stormwater, thermal aspects. Yes? While we're still on dams, what's your attitude about the dams that other mammalian species build, like beavers? Oh, okay, all right, great question. Really good question. Please repeat it. He's wondering, in comparison to man-made dams, what about beaver dams? Now, beaver dams are natural. They break, they breach, they fail. And in the overall ecology psych cycle, cycles of ecology, the beavers are coming in, they'll start a colony in a location, build a dam. And they're nocturnal, which is why you don't see them very much. We learned a lot about beavers in this job. It's very interesting. I don't have enough time to tell you everything I've been taught. <clears throat> the couple have two kits a year. They are two years old when they're kicked out, and they'll go upstream or downstream and build their own dam. So this colony establishes, they have to be eating wood bark all the time. Their teeth grow so fast, if they don't eat, it closes and they starve to death. Even in the wintertime, they're eating inside their hut. In the under the snow cover. So they get to a point where they've taken out the wood around the colony and they get so far away from water that they are nervous that they're going to get something's going to kill them, eat them. And they'll just abandon the colony and move somewhere else. And wetlands are created behind those beaver dams and there's a lot of functions and values of wetlands, one of which is flood storage. So in, a, in con contrast to man-made dams that increase flooding, beaver dams reduce flooding. And it's a tough thing to think of in your mind, but the beaver dams are what, two, three feet high? What is the Grand Coulee Dam, 150 feet tall? Anyway. Um, was another question? All right, I probably should move on, Mary Ellen. I have a quick question. Yeah. So you had one slide where you said that development affects people upstream. Yeah. Can you explain the mechanism of how you affect upstream? Oh, I will go back to this graphic. And I apologize that I blew through that so quick. So I'll spend a little bit more time on this. And I, 
All right, so again, the low one is before encroachment, the next one is downstream, the up one is what's going on upstream. This is before encroachment, no development. There's nothing there, no pavement, no rooftops, parking, roads. The downstream encroachment could be someone building a building in a floodplain, and they know it's wet, so they bring in fill and they build the first floor three feet, six feet above the floodplain. This is why we have floodplain regulations, because it blocks the flood flow. It used to go here, now there's this big building here that's got to go around because it's blocked. The peak is higher and the time to peak is quicker upstream because this water used to get past that encroachment sooner and it's now being pushed around the sides of it, one side or the other side. It's not getting past that point and upstream it's called a backwater effect. All right, thank you. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. All right. So that was two and three. This is about flood resiliency. get it to open. There we go. Okay. And how did I jump? Oh, here we go. Okay. Flood resiliency in Dummerson. This is public assistance and disaster costs. And I don't know why this is doing this. I'm going to go. Here's the image. Okay. This is Route 4. Menden Brook in Menden after Irene, and one of our major east-west arteries, Route 2 up north, 4, Route 9 down here. Took two and a half months to open this back up. There was three major contracting companies. This pie chart is public assistance in Vermont 1999 to 2015. The small 6% is non-flood disasters, the bigger is flood-related disasters, 94%, and $308 million in Vermont in that time period. And then at the bottom, Vermont disaster costs. The blue is 17%. This is 1978 to 2015, and that blue is National Flood Insurance Program reimbursements. Then the bigger part of the pie, 83%, 1999 to 2015, public assistance for flood-related disaster losses not covered by the National Flood Insurance Program, which would be somebody's house or a business. Um, the rest of this pie chart is for people who were um, assisted with public funds who did not have flood insurance. Think FEMA. NFIP is part of FEMA, but they're two different pots of money. And that was from the federal budget? I'm sorry? From the federal budget, national budget. This is Vermont. Was it from the state budget that they received money from the federal oh, budget? Oh, very good question. And I'm going to get to that. And I'm going to recommend something that you folks should talk about in town that would increase that amount of public funding. So your town history, Dummerson Public Assistance, half a million dollars in FEMA awards since Tropical Fo Storm Floyd in 1999. I don't know if you folks remember that. So Floyd, 1999, other severe storms and flooding in 2000, again in 2004, Tropical Storm Irene in 2011. We've had floods since then. We've had disaster declarations since Irene. This is Vermont annual runoff, okay, 1900 to 2011. So you got rainfall increasing going up the left side, time increasing from 1900 to 2010 on the bottom, and 
<coughs> there's a red line up here it says water year 2011 so just look at the pattern and can you see it's generally increasing look at the 25 inches and the 40 inches that last spike there was 2011 including the Irene runoff so I've shown you flood hydrographs this is hydrology what falls out of the sky and what I do it's called hydrology and hydraulics an H and H study how big should that bridge be related to flooding one's coming out of the sky one's moving through the landscape so this gets to river flow regime variables once it's out of the sky in the stream flow regime variables include magnitude how big is it frequency how often does it happen duration and if you look at that flood hydrograph it came up quick and it took a long time to dissipate timing over the year in 1927 happened in November, no tree cover. Three days of rain beforehand, and that was the, the most disastrous flood in 1927. In contrast to Irene, which happened in August, there was tree cover. We had three weeks of rain, but the ground wasn't as saturated as it was in the flood of 27. Timing over the year, rate of change, how quickly. Can you say just a bit more talk about why, why was there no tree cover in 1927? Oh, because of the time of year. Because of the time of it was year. the time of year. It was okay. November 23rd or something like that. So all of the deciduous trees had dropped their leaves. Okay. That's yeah. what I thought. So. Yeah. yeah. Just to, to make a comment on tree cover, uh, as a whitewater boater, I watch uh, water graphs a lot. And when the, in, in the winter, uh, when there's no trees, the streams are a lot flashier and there's, there's a lot yes. more runoff. Yeah. But as soon as the leaves come out in the spring, those trees are sucking water out of the ground like nobody's business. And the, the graphs moderate a whole lot, a whole lot more. Okay. So it's, yep. it's leaves pulling moisture out and drying up the, uh, the flow. Yes, good comment. So you're also going to have varying debris of varying degrees of debris and sediment load coming down through. All right, West River, 1947 to 2015. And I wasn't around back then. I don't know what happened relative to what we've just discussed with the conditions, time of year, pre precedent rain events. But just look at the general pattern here, all right? 2012, so Irene is in here, all right? and look at 5,000, and this is cubic feet per second going up time, going this way. The majority of them are down here, okay? Yes? Oh, okay, thank you. That, would, that helps a lot, I, I didn't know that. Everybody hear the, the comment? He said the dams were built in the 50s. Then they're flood control dams, so they're doing their job. Thank you, I didn't know that. Yeah, yes. <clears throat> so now, West River, January 2018. This is a week. This is where we had that variable weather. So again, I brought your attention to 5,000 CFS. This is 3,000 CFS. January 18th to January 25th. And we got that cold snap. Okay, and snow is not melting, there's no rainfall precipitation, the ground is freezing up. Boom, overnight the flow drops. Boom, it gets really cold. I don't remember that, <laughs> I remember that really cold day. Boom, it drops again, and then it warmed up, all right, gradually, and all of a sudden it got really warm on the 24th. Everything starts melting, boom way up. Do you remember the ice jam, the ice out back then? There's the ice out right there. Then the flows drop down and it's receding. 
Natural disasters in Vermont. Think about wildfires, earthquakes, um, wind storms, ice storms. Flooding is the most common natural disaster in Vermont. This is why flood resiliency is such an important topic and why I was happy to come down here to have a conversation with you folks. Tropical Storm Irene 2011 created a lot of fluvial erosion hazards. That's a hundred dollar word, fluvial. Fluvial is anything related to streams or rivers. 10 minutes, thanks. 20. 20, good. So think of those eroded banks and there's a house sitting at the top and the bank went back 15, 20 feet towards the house. <clears throat> That's a fluvial erosion hazard. Inundation flooding, when the water comes up and floods your basement, they're related but it's different. That those homes didn't get water in the basement, they're now in a precarious situation where if that bank keeps going, eventually that house is gonna drop in. Irene created a lot of fluvial erosion hazards that have changed the sediment regimes to an increased sediment load that alters how we need to plan for flood resiliency in many towns. And I'm going to get to River Carters. We got that into our town plan in Plymouth and zoning in Plymouth after Irene. And I went to those meetings. I'm putting on my state hat. I'm taking off my state hat, putting on my taxpayer's hat. And I expected, and I got blasted the first meeting. This is a property rights taking. I said, no, it's not about taking out an existing home. It's about empowering the zoning planning not to approve a house in harm's way. Not to put a new house where it's going to get whacked. Here's a map of Vermont decades of flood locations in purple circles. Did you have any idea that we've had that many floods? Some of them are localized, some of them are statewide, maybe county. In Dummerston, you've got nine sites, decades of flooding in Dummerston. And maybe you live near these sites. You all know what the outline of your town looks like. And I think we're sitting up high and dry because I don't remember being here with Lee after Irene. Irene road damage into Vermont as of January 2012. So the red are state roads, black, local road damage. You see Money Brook and there's an arrow right here. And I've got some fly slides. This is my town of Plymouth. And we need to give rivers room to move. They're going to meander downstream, and we cannot stop that process. You, just, you can't stop the power of water. We've got to give rivers room to move and stop building new infrastructure in harm's way. Flood resiliency means giving streams and rivers room to move and stop fighting the power of water. The things that I've seen after Irene, the power, I, the power of water is just incredible. You might know Marlboro Auto Collision on Route 9. So... The building was put there, and there was fill put out, which constrained the channel of the wet stone brook. The building got knocked in. <laughs> they, they built it back again. They got town permission to build it back. And it's just a matter of time before that's going to happen again. And it's an unrealistic and unsustainable expectation of land use and river carters. We, we want to stop this cycle of rebuilding. The most lunatic I heard was somewhere like Missouri. 16 times the guy's house was whacked in a flood. He got paid national flood insurance money. 16 times, how ridiculous is that? And guess what? His wife divorced him. She doesn't want to live there anymore. <laughs> we know who the smart was in that couple. <clears throat> Way too much here. I'm going to read you the top. This is from Vermont DEC. River Management Program, past, current, and projected tropical storm Irene flood recovery work. This was in uh, January, February of 2012. I'm just going to read you the top three. 
of all damaged sites reconstructed statewide in 2011, 10% were restored in a manner which reduced the pre-flood conflict or risk of loss. 10% were done right. 30% maintained the pre-flood condition of vulnerability. Still not very good. Listen to this. 60% were reconstructed such that the risk of damage has increased on-site and off-site. We don't want to go there. 10% were done right. 90% were done wrong. This is what we're trying to, in this flood resiliency, we're trying to accomplish. Money Brook in Plymouth, I showed you the arrow. This big white right here, this is all the sediment that came down from Money Brook. If you take a look at the brown here, there's an eroded bank there. And I'm going to give you an example of flood resiliency, what occurred in our town. So this is a topographic map. And if you can see this shading right here, I looked at that um, second Tuesday after I read, I got there and I was like, what is going on here? Look at the topo map. Oh, this has been going on for a long time. We've had three glacial periods in Vermont. The last one was like 16, 18,000 years ago. And the geologists debate that number. Well, that means it's meaningless to me. 16,000, 18,000, I don't care. I can't fathom that time period. But when I look at this, it's been occurring since the last glacier retreated. Here's a picture of the Money Brook mass slope failure, the stored sediments in the background. This is about 70 feet tall, it's about 150 feet long, and this is just one of them. Continually revegetating, naturally self-arresting, and then a flood comes along, resets it up. So, Here's an aerial view from a helicopter. There's that same field deposit, Pingree Flats, Route 100 in Plymouth, Money Brook Bank erosion. That building there is here. Look at the size of the boulders. The bridge on Money Brook is back here off the picture. The bridge clogged up. All of the sediment, somebody, um, Estimated 6,000 cubic yards of sediment just got to the lake alone. So these folks, uh, there's a garage, a shed, and then their camp is over here. This is, this is not, they live in Rutland. They don't live here full time. This is a camp. So our town hall from the flood of 73, we have a picture of this and it looks the same. You can't tell except the one's a Polaroid, the other one came from a digital camera. Here's the house that I was telling you about, Black River Bank Erosion. You may not be able to tell there's a house right there. This is about 15 feet tall and the river went back in Irene, 12, 15 feet, something like that. The house was put on the market Nobody would buy it. The price kept going down and somebody bought it for a song. It's only a matter of time before I get contacted by that person. So, a River Carter example. So, this is the house on the Black River I just showed you. The River Carter is in, in tan. So the road comes up, here's their property boundaries, here's their house. The entire house is in the area of potential erosion from the Black River over time. Not a good place to build a house. If there was no house there, our town could now say to a potential buyer, no, we're not gonna permit a house there. Just not a good place to build a house. All right. So this is a slide. You can see the road's been taken out. The bridge is, is down, the flow is going that way up the screen and very calm. It doesn't really matter. Was Irene damaged due to climate change? We don't need to argue that. It happened. Okay, now how did I, there we go. All right, so this is a map of Vermont. 
and all the different floods. And between 1973 and 2011 on this map, 25 disastrous floods. Some of them small, a couple towns, county, flood of 2011 and 1973. There's two green lines for the flood of 73 and Irene. At the top, Irene was the second most costly and third large scale flood since 1973. We have 84 years of stream gauging records in Vermont, U.S. Geological Survey, and there's one on the Ball Mountain Dam, there's Saxons River, there's one. You'll see these big concrete things sticking up on the side of the stream. That's the stream gauge station. 84 years since 1927 flood, we have a frequency of once every 14 years. And people think that a 100 year flood is only going to happen once every 100 years. But that's not the way it works. It's chance, probability, like rolling dice. In 2011, in May, we had a 100 year flood up north. Down here in August, or I should say statewide in August, we had another 100 year flood. The flood of 1930, the hur yeah, hurricanes of 1937 and 1938, one year apart. So, you can't say, oh, it's never going to happen again. It's going to happen again. I got five. Go ahead. You're saying in 84 years, the frequency was once every 14. In um, 38 years, since 1973, it's been every one and a half years. 25 floods in 38 years since 1973. Yeah. Okay. I got five years to retire. <laughs> My odds are not good. I'm going to be doing this again. At the bottom, the Irene flood disaster areas of greatest damage <clears throat> have nearly equaled, equaled, or exceeded previous damages. So can you get things like the quarry road built right so you don't have to do it again? Now again, the quarry road is built to a 25-year storm event. Will it survive an Irene? I hope so the water would hopefully go over the top of the road. The structure is robust, it should still stay there. All right, these are various Irene photos. And this top left is Menden Brook Route 4. I've already shown you that. This is um, the bridge on the bottom left is Rochester. And I'm not sure where these two were taken. And At the top, three quarters of assessed reaches are unstable. One quarter are stable. This is using our stream geomorphic assessment studies and looking at those and teasing out the data. All right. This is an Army Guard bulldozer in Wardsboro, Brook and Wardsboro. At the bottom, I wrote, don't do this to rivers and roads. The flow is going that way. He's pushing up gravels, digging the stream deeper. You see in the bottom of the picture upstream, there's road erosion. He's not doing anything. He's wasting his time, disrupting the environment, and he's not doing anything for the road. We need to stop doing this. This will happen again. This is Money Brook, Pingree Flats, Route 100. The bridge was totally plugged up. The water's going over the top. I had talked about a balance, natural balance, river equilibrium. Much of our river instability is a result of our historic flood responses, doing the wrong thing. Thinking this is the right thing to do, doing the wrong thing. Aerial photo, the second one to the left at the bottom. Looks like a road. That's actually, that's actually a river. They took everything out, smoothed it all out. The flow is going through the gravel, coming out at the bottom. And then the National Guard I just told you about, the top, and this is Route 100A in my town. And the fill was put out into the channel, and it was 18 feet wide. We went back in V-Trans, took it out, and built a stacked rock wall 
and from here over is 27 feet. That's the natural width that that stream wants to have, Penny Hollow Brook. So we went in, put in the riprap, constrained the channel, go back, take it out, and rebuild it. We spent money three times there. I can't tell you how many nuts to keep rebuilding stuff. It wasn't fixed the first time, but this is what it should look like. So this is a culvert stream channel outlet. The width of it is the natural stream channel width. The bottom of it, natural animals, aquatic organisms can go through. Deer, bear would walk through this. Now this is Vermont Flood Ready Emergency Relief and Assistance Fund, ERAF. And this gets to your question earlier. So I said I'm going to recommend that you do something here. Your town has adopted four out of five mitigation measures, which means that you get 12.5% additional funding elevation, eligibility, excuse me, 12.5% additional funding eligibility in the next flood. If you adopt the fifth measure to protect river corridors, there's another 17 and a half. So the feds pay 75, state pays 17 and a half, the town pays 17 and a half. My town has gone through all of this. You've done the first four, you haven't done the last five. At the What's the site of that fifth one? I'm uh, sorry? <coughs> Where is that fifth mitigation possibility? Okay, that's river corridor management that you would put into your town plan, into your town zoning. Do you have zoning in town here? Yes. Yes. Okay, so did that answer the question, sir? Yes, I was thinking it was an actual physical location that you were telling me. No, 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 no. It would be um, specific locations in town. There's no sense in having a river corridor management up here. You're on top of the hill. At the bottom, you had 500,000 flood damages. Another, if you do that fifth measure and you get another 15, another 5%, excuse me, a RAF eligibility, that would be $25,000, which is about the value of a pickup truck for the town. Small pickup truck. <coughs> All right, so here's a, what you have done, you've adopted the VTrans road and bridge standards in 2013, adopted a local emergency operations plan in 2017, in 1991 adopted the National Flood Insurance Program, in 2017 you adopted a local hazard mitigation plan. And so the last thing is adopting river corridor protection. And what was put into our town plan was about a paragraph, maybe two, and then in zoning, it was added a couple lines, not much. We also in our town put in, we had riparian buffers for just the lakes and ponds, and it's now riparian buffers for all waterways. So at the bottom, here's my recommendation. Your town plan is due to be revised in 2019. So start talking it up in town amongst your neighbors maybe your select board members, etc. Can we get river card of protection in our town plan for more ERAF funds? You'd go from 12.5% to 17.5%. Uh, these, I'm going to do a PDF of these and Mary Ellen Copeland is going to put this on the Dummerston webpage. At the bottom there's the flood ready web URL. Now here's Getting back to where in town, what physical locations. Here's 911 buildings in your river corridor and special flood hazard areas. So this is a map that I got off our webpage. It has the flood inundation areas and it has the fluvial erosion hazard areas in the river corridor. And so you got all these, all these little black dots are buildings. 911 addresses and <clears throat> you could potentially do some really good things for all of those owners. So, so does every town have an app like that? Yes. All of those houses that are in risky areas, right? 
Yes, the map is there for all towns and it's just a matter of turning on the 911 buildings and printing it. Yeah. Because there's some people from other towns here. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Tom, could you say what the red is and what the brown is on that map? If I can go back. <laughs> I have somehow changed my screen. No, I'm sorry. I can't go back. I can show you that afterwards. All right, so this is an example of a special flood hazard area and river corridor. And if you take a look up above, there's a farm field. And you can see the farm road drive coming in. So this is very typical. The farmers are reaching retirement age. Their kids want to have nothing to do with the farm. And so they're thinking, we don't want to give up the farm, but how do we pay for our retirement? Oh, let's do a subdivision. We can do some homes. And you got one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven homes already in the flood hazard area. The river corridor on this side, maybe they say, oh, we'll, we'll put in six, eight homes. Subdivide it up and people can build their own homes. The town that has those river corridor in their town plan and zoning can say no you've got to put the house sites in the farm field question Todd, i don't think the town can say you can't build there but it has the right to say it's got to be a certain elevation it's got to be designed properly engineered properly. okay so you're getting into a very complex discussion um, that's the short answer the long answer is maybe we can talk after because um, you're getting into legal things and not an attorney, you're getting into a lot of different stuff. So, so people insist sometimes that they put their houses there, is that the thing that happens? They say, yes, I'm going to do it, whether it's in that zone. Okay, the, the bottom line is they don't know. They don't know that they have a piece of property in harm's way. Oh, the babbling brook. So. Join the rising tide of ERAF towns. <laughs> towns on the ERAF cutting edge since 2014. 21% of towns since 2014 are eligible for the full ERAF money. 41% of towns are eligible for the 12.5%, which is where Dumberston is. And 38% of towns are eligible for 7.5%. Do you know where Grover is? Uh, you know, I'm sorry, I didn't look. I don't know the answer to that. Good question. If you go to the Flood Ready for us website, you can click on Brad Bar. There's a short report and there's a, a longer report that comes up. All right, so how do you learn more about this? Step one, Shannon Pitlick is the river scientist, and there's her phone number. And again, this will be available for you. You have to write it down now if you don't have the time. Step two, John Broker Campbell is the floodplain manager. Hopefully, going to be able to get into your select board reading and make a. He's got a much more detailed ERAF presentation, but um, <laughs> frankly, if you want to see all that level of information, go to the select board meeting. Step three Chris Campney is the executive director of the Wyndham Regional Commission. And like all the regional commissions, this is part of their job, help you out with getting these kind of changes. In so the general question is what, it, what can we do in town here? And Lee is still here, good. This part is about rivers and roads training. And this is something that was mandated by legislature in 2012. Had seven years, we're going into our eighth year next, this year, 2018. Um, so here is Pingry Flats again. And that road, that section of Route 100 A was buried in four and a half feet of sediment. And I got there and that was what blew me away. I was just like, where did all this come from? I've already showed you this slide. I've already showed you that slide. This is the type of thing we're trying to get to road foremen, V-trans workers, people that have flood response as part of their job duties emergency management director in your town. Um, 
It's, it's open to everybody. We've got different sessions. We've had two in Wilmington. We'll probably go to Brattleboro next year. Show this slide back train. Oh boy, don't we talk a lot about this slide. <laughs> Todd, do you have a short answer that we can respond to people who say, hey, you've got to get out there and dredge those rivers so the floods will fit into them? I mean, it's, you said this is, we've got to stop doing this. I just want to know if you have a concise answer to people who say, yeah, you should be out there. You're making it worse by digging it deeper. Yeah, but why? You're making the problems worse because it's unstable. The floodwaters can't get out into the floodplain. But that's their point. They want to keep it in the space. They want to keep it out of the floodplain because it's going up there and flooding houses. So they argue that, you know, why not keep it in the river chain? I've had probably over 6,000 people I've talked to since Irene. 95% of people I can convince, and there's 5% that just refuse to listen. Their mind is made up. Don't confuse me with the facts. It's a very difficult conversation to have. Sir? Um, a lot of this problem seems to come from the, uh, seems to stem from the Connecticut River Flood Control Management Act. You know, like back in the 40s and 50s, towns like Hartford downstream yep. were completely flooded. <laughs> What's your opinion as to how it could be managed more effectively? Okay, so how could, how could the Connecticut River flood control have been managed more effectively? How could Connecticut River flood control have been managed more effectively? So instead of building all these dams, I'm sorry. Instead of building all these dams upstream. Instead of building all the dams upstream, <laughs> that is an extremely complicated topic. It's really a bit complicated. The short answer is Federal Emergency, I'm sorry, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC, relicensed for all those dams. They're, uh, because they're over different ages, they're starting to come into the rivers program for review. We have a flow regulation section. And so that is being looked at now. You have that infrastructure that cost a lot of money to put in. It's developing energy and choose an energy source. Somebody complains about wind, somebody complains about solar, so every type of energy source that we have, somebody complains about it. And so the complexity of that issue, um, we don't, I'm sorry, sir, we don't have the time. I can talk to you after. All right, so our rivers and roads tier two track, tier one is online. It takes an hour if you're familiar with all the topics. It doesn't take very long at all. Tier two, we have classroom, river flume table, and field trips. In the classroom, two days, we do PowerPoint exercises. The river flume table in the middle, we do both days. Day two, we set up a disaster. And they're seeing the flume table run wet in the first day, we can set the disaster up in the dry, they've got to fix it with the things that we talk about in those two days, and then turn the water on and see how well that fixes it. And both days we go out on the river, on the streams, we look at these beforehand, we get them set up and what's going on in each individual location. Day one, what are stable reaches? Day two, what are unstable reaches? Uh, yes. To answer your question, that flume table or the stream table, that would answer anyone's question about yeah, cha channelizing the stream. Yeah. yeah so the flume tables, we own three. The Rivers Program has three. And there are other entities in the state. And I just learned yesterday there's another. Your regional commission, Wyndham Regional Commission, is going to buy one. Putting in a grant application. It's mesmerizing. If you've never seen one before, it's so cool. Is this, Jan, is this the noise that you're hearing? It's no. causing a lot of static. Okay. So, so if you ever have a chance to see one, really, really worthwhile. The Rivers and Roads Training Program has been hugely successful. I can't take any credit for it. I didn't develop it. I'm just making the presentations. 
everybody is saying, oh, now I understand. I always thought the river management engineer was blowing smoke in my face. And there's, a, there's an online, it's about a nine minute video of this. And I'm sorry, Jensen. We put a video clip on our smartphones and maybe show it to people. <laughs> <laughs> so the Rivers and Roads Tier 2 training is to promote community flood resiliency from our reading lessons learned, intended for a wide range of state, municipal, and private sector transportation staff. But if you folks want to sign up and go, it's free. You know, you can go. Number three. Well, we have two in the Vermont in the VTrans Training Center in Berlin, those are open to the public. And then the others that we hold around the state are through Vermont Local Roads, geared to VTrans, Town, and Region Planning Commission. So some of them are open this year. Three will be open to the public. Two will be um, a smaller audience. Including yeah. in southern Vermont? <laughs> so my card's over there, and we can uh, I can get the, the information on where they're being held. Mm -hmm. So three, gain knowledge and skills to distinguish between stable and unstable rivers, types of river instability, forecast rivers response to alternative structural elements and design, and build those treatments for more robust repairs to our roadway infrastructure. So these folks, day two in the disaster fix, well, was a small culvert They'll put in a bigger culvert. We've got three tables set up. And one group will say, well, we should put in a bridge. Flip the water on. After 10 minutes, we say, OK, now walk around and look at the other tables in here. Our bridge survived. Look, their culvert did make it. <laughs> no, no, no. This is these are the comments. It's very powerful um, for them to see these types of things. So. Developing understanding and skills. This is again Route 100 in Cambridge Flats in my town. Stable versus unstable rivers. What some some river types like an alluvial fan. This is an alluvial fan. If you think of the Mississippi River Delta that's being built out into the Gulf of Mexico, it's the same process, but it happens on land. So. Oh, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, the importance of aquatic habitat. Now, most of these folks are anglers, so they, they get it, and we do fish shopping. And they're all astounded at the amount of fish. If you've never seen fish shopping done, it doesn't hurt the fish. It, it's amazing. You look at this, and you can't see anything, and the surface is swimming. They drop the line in, um, like, maybe 10 seconds or something like that. So it doesn't hurt them. It just makes their muscles and they float to the surface, or swim to the surface. Public safety, roads, and money is at the bottom here. That's that sustainability diagram that I showed you. The public safety, roads, and money, and they don't believe us in the field, but when they take the training, if it's good for the river, it's good for us, it's good for our budget. After taking the training, they're all like, oh, I need to build it a little bit bigger and I'm going to save a lot of money down the road for my taxpayers. Again, much of our river instability is a result of our historic flood responses. So, you know, we're telling these folks, here's what's good to do, here's what's not to do, and for Pete's sake, don't do the bad things because you're just setting it up to make it worse. <coughs> they got a manual that's <clears throat> Should have brought a copy. Not that big. <coughs> Laminated, spiral bound. They can keep it in their vehicle. <coughs> They're a designer. They can keep it at their desk. Excuse me. Is, is that manual available as a PDF that we can download? It's on. Our, I believe it's on our web page. Yes. Is that be a great resource? Yes. Yeah. Uh, great folks. If you want to grab my card, I can. Yeah. And I can let Mary Ellen know. I'm pretty sure it's on our web page, yes. I've already showed you this one. And we're showing them these things. Here's the parameters to make these things flood resilient so you don't lose them quickly. How much time do I have, Ed? 
I got five. Okay. This, the boulders in the bottom of the stream is called substrate. That's the hundred dollar word for it. The bed. There's ways to do this that are actually pretty cost effective. And it's a legal requirement now that if you're doing a stream crossing, road embankment stabilization, maybe riprap stabilization behind your home, you can't adversely impact fish and wildlife. They're right in the law in 1972. Been that way forever. This is downstream of that culvert. So you're seeing these first three riffles are rock weirs. If you look way downstream, the fourth one is actually a bedrock outcrop. So do you see the step pools there? That's a type of environment if you're a fisherman, you're in peak crowd limited, you know. Um, the stone weirs are to stabilize the channel bed and banks. They create the fish habitat and there's a protective measure for the upstream culvert. So the shape is V-shaped going up. It's higher at the bank, lower in the bottom of the bed, and higher up above. And if you take a look at this, there's different flow patterns going on here. A lot of flow is going through here. The fish of all different size classes can come through these structures depending on how strong they are. The adults would come through the main flow right there. And the flow is going that way. They're designed to go upstream. If you put them in reverse, they fail instantly. And we show that in this reverse road stream if they do it right. And so the point of the V is upstream? The point of the V is upstream. Okay. They, if, the, if you picture the flow coming at me, they would be shaped like this. This would be the top of the bank, and this would be the channel bed. So we have it. How do they figure out, is there a system for figuring out how they put that in, how they shape it, how they... Yes, and there's a diagram in the manual that somebody asked him, is it, I think it's on the website, I'm pretty sure, and this is in that, um, okay. I don't remember what page it is, but it's very easy to find. Okay. So we had this disaster fix, and somebody's setting up of rock weir, but in the wrong direction. So I said, geez, why don't we build one in the other direction and see what happens? Because I'd never seen it before. I was curious. Flip the water on, the one in the wrong direction failed immediately. And what's really cool about the flume cables is if you watch for a minute, you're seeing two years of channel changes. If you watch 15 minutes, you're seeing 30 years of channel changes. With the exception of large floods like I mean, the channel changes take decades. If you do something wrong, it might be five or ten years before you see that ripple effect and it starts to unravel. Within three years after I mean, people will call me back, my river trap is failing. And if you put in vegetation stabilization, that lasts a lot longer. The root mass much better at binding the soil. If you just generally look at a tree, the amount of biomass in the trees is the same as the biomass in the root underground. And you think about it, it needs to have that so it can do this in the wind. So flip the water on and it failed within 15, 20 seconds. That was just shocking. Oh my gosh. And of course the other one didn't fail. So he's all upset with me. You set me up for that. I said, no, I said, I didn't know what, how quickly it was going to fail. And I was pretty surprised at how, how quickly it would fail. He, he liked it. He was initially I was like, okay, I've got to calm this guy down. He's going to hit me. So, why do I care? Why would I want to go to one of these rivers and roads training programs? This is a picture of a stream channel that is natural, hasn't been altered by mankind. The 
top says riparian vegetation. Riparian is the zones near <coughs> the river, lake, pond, streams. How important the riparian buffer, the riparian vegetation is. And there's a lot of different things that goes on. I just talked about soil stability, filters, stormwater, great habitat for birds, all kinds of mammals, etc. The insects and the tree canopy fall into the water, the fish feed on that. Channel dimensions. And again, this is a natural channel, it hasn't been altered. And what is the bank full width from the top to the other side? What's the bank full depth? We talk about that. It's very it doesn't matter the size of the little tiny stream, big Mississippi River, they all exhibit that characteristic all around the world. You've got to understand channel dimensions and what that means to a road embankment, stabilization, a culvert bridge. In the middle here, nature looks messy. Now, I look at that. Like, wow, that's beautiful. Okay. The people operating heavy equipment, they're accustomed to building a road. Smooth and flat. They're accustomed to grading around new buildings. So it looks like a golf course. You've got to tell them, no. Messy. It's got to be messy. Log that's laid across there, that ain't going anywhere. It's not an, any threat to a car or a bridge downstream. If it started to move, it would start to go that way before it would go right through whatever the crossing structure is. After Irene, everybody wanted to take those out. We explained to them that's creating channel roughness that slows down the water, creates fish habitat. Other benefits. And down at the bottom, I love streams and rivers. All of these people, whether they fish or not, if I were to ask you, I'm sure all of you would say, I love streams and rivers, just looking at it, just driving. Okay? So it's <clears throat> getting them to think about it differently. And many of them, oh, this is just a change of mindset. This is actually going to be cheaper because I don't take all those trees out. There's a guy that I've worked with in my area after I read a contractor, and he took the Rivers and Roads training program. And he was afterwards, great, great, great. So I see him getting gas. Maybe the next year, it doesn't matter. I said, hey, how are you? He goes, that Rivers and Roads train was fabulous. This is exactly what he said to me. Tell me and I'll forget. Show me and I'll remember the river. Can I take that again? I said, yeah, we've had four or five people do a refresher. You know, people that took it three or four years ago. Thought it was so well worthwhile that they wanted to take it again. Now, you don't have an internet link here. I was going to just click on this. It's about an eight, eight and a half minute video that PBS Run Outdoors did. It was released last year. I tried to get it from them to burn to bring here. And my regrets. But you can see this in the. Um, you can even Google it, YouTube. Um, it was last, no, it was 2016 that it was taken. And it shows that classroom, flume table, and outdoor on the rivers. And there's actually one of the V Trans guys in there. And he says something like, I've been doing this for 30 years, and I now recognize that it's actually cheaper to do it the right way. And that brings us to the end of part four questions. Major events over the last half, how many years? It struck me when I looked at that. 
almost, you know, the great majority of those events were from the center of Vermont north and only a few down here. Any thoughts about why that's true? Okay, and so, good observation. And so, you know the spine of the Green Mountains. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know, Mount Mansfield is the highest, and then Killington is the second highest. Mm -hmm. And so if the weather pattern is coming east, I'm sorry, west to east, and it's got a cl the clouds have to climb up over the Green Mountains as they're climbing up, the precipitation drops out. They come in the other direction. East to west, when they hit the Green Mountains and start to climb, the water has to drop out. So, um, if you were to look at a profile of well, the Northeast Kingdom, is called the Piedmont of Vermont. If you're familiar with that term, the Piedmont, P I E D M O N T, it's an elevated um, landform. It's got hills, etc. It's away from the Green Mountains, and it's higher elevation than everywhere else. So what you saw on the map is a reflection of Vermont is generally higher up north, and as you get closer to the Atlantic Ocean, the elevation drops. That's a very broad generalization. Mm -hmm. but it's, so is it fair to say that the clouds drop more rain when they hit the mountains? Yes, because if this is the mountain range and the clouds come in, when they have to climb, then I don't want to get into the physics of it, but it just, it's, it's weight. The water drops out because the, the, the air mass is trying to move and it can't carry along the weight of the water. So it starts to collect as raindrops and drops out. Sir. To answer part of that question, uh, it takes a special hurricane, special guidance to get a hurricane over Long Island and up the Connecticut River Valley to smack southern Vermont and, and, and New Hampshire. They, they call them the Long Island Expresses, and the 38 hurricane was very most likely that as, as well. But we're a narrow slot to, it, it, the, the hurricane has to hit Long Island just perfectly and have the right uh, weather patterns to guide it that way. Irene, thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, we, we did a program in August about the Hurricane of 38, so if you want to see the, the, what he's talking about, go on, online to our website or to BCTV, Hurricane of 38 with Stephen Long, and you can see just how that happened. Stephen's got a book, too. So, okay. There's a map of the Irene track that was out of the ocean first hit the islands and then the uh, South Carolina. And so there's time intervals on that track. And I looked at the track map and I'm sitting next to a map of the Eastern United States and the first mountain range that Irene had to hit was the Green Mountains. And I don't know if you're aware, it stalled on Killington Mountain for three and a half hours. And that's why Killington had 13 inches of rain. That was the most of any of the locations in the state. Um, we're, I got two more sets here, but I should probably move on. That was part four. Come on. And here's the river cars part. And river management cars and communities reduce adverse impacts. I'm going to quick go through this. Our common Vermont Rivers program goals, manage to protect and restore the stream, equilibrium and resolve the human conflicts with rivers in the most economically and ecologically sustainable manner. There's that social, economic, environmental piece. Plan river carvers to remediate the instability that is largely responsible for erosion conflicts, increased sediment and nutrient loading, and reduction of good river habitat. Get back to all the money brought into the state annually, $31 million with fishing. What's that? Go ahead and spend it on the street. Oh, thank you. Common River Goals continued 
We work hard on floodplain protection section work to reduce flood risks by protecting and restoring natural and beneficial river and floodplain functions. Working with landowners, towns, regional planning commissions, NGOs, and non-governmental organizations, and agencies of state and federal government. I've already showed you this slide, and when I saw this in grad school, I was like, oh, wow, that's really pretty. Mother Nature is so cool. And now after I read, I look at all the, I don't like looking at this picture. I see all of those homes that were built in these locations and they're no longer there. I don't want to think about those things. I've showed you this channel evolution model on the other side here. At the top it says 75% of assessed streams, those stream geomorphic assessments, right? 75% are in dis disequilibrium and lack access to a floodplain. That's a lot. Stage one, stable, 22% in equilibrium. Stage two, it's starting to become unstable. 20% are cutting down and getting steeper. Stage three, 42% are incised and they're widening. Stage four, 13% are starting to build a floodplain. And this diagram here, the shape up above is this purple line here. And we've got a blue line here, and it says stage three. And what we don't want to do is do some kind of a project that drives it from stage five, stable, back through four to three, and unstable. And gosh, that happened a lot after I read. It's this kind of thing that roads, trains, boundaries. Well, I'm here to talk to you about flood resiliency. Water and stream power. And I've seen uh, probably about two thirds of that opening. Huge rocks moved that you just, you look at it, you go, how could that have moved? Stream power and flood damage are increased two times to five times or more in dredged streams versus natural streams. There you go, Dan. Yeah, thank you. There's your answer. And the next one is related. In restored floodplains, stream power and the resultant damage is similarly decreased two and a half to five times compared to burn streams without floodplain connection due to gravel berms built after floods. So the power of water, you're building berms, dredging a river, you're just setting it up for instability, problems, heartache, money unnecessarily spent. Water weight increases with depth at the bottom here. Water weighs 62.4 pounds per foot of water, and the water weight is cumulative. You're coming down off the hillside, you've got the floodplain, you've got the channel. The one foot of water at the bottom is 62.4 pounds. You get a little bit of rain, it comes up two feet, you've got 124.8, 124.8, 187.2 at four feet, 249.6, five feet, 312 pounds. Right above the channel, 374 pounds. Out the floodplain, you've only got a foot of water, 62.4 pounds. That's why you don't see the scour that you do in the channel unless the hill goes like this. So this is a very simple way to explain the power of water. There's a lot of physics and engineering calculations in there that nobody wants to know but me. One last quick question on that. Yeah. Are they to also build berms with the material that they dredge out of the stream? That That's what was done. So there's a double layer. Our at the time said, get in the rivers and dig them deep and dig them deeper, you don't need a permit. And he'll never understand what he did to the state and the environment and the economy. So take these numbers, you dredge this down two more feet, and you see how much more that how higher that number is at the top. This is the simplest way to explain it. 
there's other very complex equations to explain that. Does that answer the question, Jay? Yeah? The water actually weighs more the deeper it is. Yes. That's and I'm sorry? Are you talking about response to Irene when there was digging? Okay. Response to Irene and just any, any type of work being done. If you get into a stream at your house, my sister's and I did this one with kids. You take boulders and you build a little dam. So, you know, we had maybe, because we were little kids, you can only pick up a rock like that big when you're a kid. So maybe it's foot high, two feet high. Maybe we back water the, pond, the stream three inches. It was fun. It wasn't anything that we were trying to make permanent. We knew it would go out in a storm. There's no harm in doing that. When people call me and they want me to go tell that kid to stop and I get there and I say, did you have fun? I said, just don't get hurt, okay? No, you don't need a permit from me. So that is a minimal impact. The legal term is from the Latin, de minimis impact. As opposed to a machine getting in there, or hogging it out, and then taking it and either putting it on the side, like you were talking, Jan, or building a gravel dam. And those are those gravel dams are blocking fish passage. Those little rock dams that the kids build, the fish can go through. They can find holes and go through. It's not an aquatic organism passage blockage. I'm going to keep going here if everybody's all set. Okay. All right, so this is a schematic of a river corridor protection project. And so <clears throat> valley side slope, valley side slope, the stream coming up through. Somebody's got a farm complex there, farmhouse, barns, outbuildings. Pasture up here, cropland down here, the valley bottom. This yellow line is the meander center line. These blue lines are the edge of the riverbank and the river corridor is designated. They're not losing their pasture. They can still here inside that buffer, the river corridor protection, excuse me, they can still pasture cropland. It's the channel management rights that the landowner has given up. They're not selling their property, it's just the rights to manage the channel. And this is in Enosburg, Tyler Branch, and there's a lot of colored lines here. Center line in 1924, 41, 62, 69, 1970, 1980, 2003, 2008. The outer red line is where the river corridor is. There are no buildings inside those red lines. And why we hope that nobody ever does put a building inside those red lines. If you had some need, take a look at there's a road that goes through it. If you had some need to cross that river corridor, of course, we're going to say, yeah. We can't single-handedly shut down the line. That's not legal. We've got to get people to yes on a permit. All right, progress across Vermont. 77 of 251 towns have river corridor or enhanced floodplain bylaws. My town in Plymouth is one of those. We have 90 river corridor easements. This is channel management rights purchased to attenuate flows at key watershed locations. We have one of those in my town, Pingree Flats. 45 communities with completed river corridor floodplain restoration projects. Again, my town, Pingree Flats, has one of those. And these are you know, they're relatively easy things to accomplish. It's the political part that's the difficult part to accomplish, is to get people's mindsets changed, like you're talking, Jan, to understand that this is really a good thing. Now this, what am I doing here? Here we go. This is a sign in 
Federal Emergency Management Agency Hazard Mitigation Grant Program is a buyout. And the feds will pay the town to take ownership of the property at the value of the property before the flood hit. So they go to the tax rolls, what was the value of the property? The money gets funneled through the state to the Regional Planning Commission, to the town, and then the value to the owner. So let's say it's a dollar for the value of the building. It takes 50 cents to tear the building down, take out the driveway, the garage, etc. Feds send $1.50 to the state, and the town gets the 50 cents to take it down. There's a restriction that they can use it, but they can't put a building on it. If you want to put a bench for a park, you can do that. If you want to build an access, you can do that. So, and Irene, we had 124 buyouts. This was one of the signs that was put up talking about what the buyout was. And it's a long process, but the owners that I've talked to that have gone through it are happily I'm going up on the hill now, and I never have to go through that again. And then the town gets, you know, they can put a park, they can let it go wild, whatever they want. Different things, different towns have done it. And then here's another one that um, I couldn't get onto his DVD, and it's here. This is the Connecticut River Council, and a video of how rivers move. Yeah, it's, a, it's right new. Yep. Um, so I'm done with part five. It's about 10 more minutes of, the, of slides. And I guess people have to leave. Can we go up? Is it okay to go ahead and do the 10 more minutes? Yeah. Okay. Everybody okay with that? Okay. Now this is a precursor to Tom Rogers, who's going to be talking about how it affects our animal world. any conflicts with what I've said about the previous two or Tom Rogers. They're the experts go what they have to say. Rivers and habitat connectivity. So we impact our world. We're the only species on the world that causes global changes. And think about wars, how much damage the wars do. So there's two pieces. Biotic is the living impact. Abiotic is the physical drivers of processes and function in carbon sequestration and release and changes in the ecology of ecosystems are the current research, research trends. So physical rivers. So we're not here to talk about what the rivers are we doing. We're here to talk about what do we do in response. We can't change what the rivers do. We cannot change the abiotic drivers of process and function, but we can change some of decisions affecting biotic drivers. As our society is the biggest living factor adversely impacting the ecology, we killed the dodo bird in the 17th century by bringing dogs, pigs, cats, and rats. It gets back to John Muir. Everything is connected to everything else. So the artificial wildlife has a lands and habitat program provides expertise for the management and conservation of wildlife and ecosystems on public lands. The program staff also provide technical assistance to private landowners for the benefit of wildlife habitat management, enhancement, and restoration. So I've got the telephone number here for the Springfield Fish and Wildlife Office. Give them a call, they come out. Your taxpayer dollars are paying for their salary, so this is no charge to you. You're happy to come out. So fish habitat and populations. This is a study that was just released in fall of 2017, going back to the 1950s, and all the different fish population surveys. They compiled all the all that data. Great news. Fisheries habitat and fish populations have rebounded since tropical storm Irene. Now, when I first started off walking around, there was dead fish in all, all, all around. So within like three days, there's only raccoon prints and there's no more fish. So, you know, I've been fishing since I was a little kid. You know, how did they 
Did any survive? Asked one of the fisheries biologists if they had the instinct when the water was receding to swim back into the channel, they make it. Otherwise, they die. So the fish population was impacted. Fisheries habitat was heavily impacted by what we did. And good news is we balanced since tropical storm Irene. Wild brook trout populations are essentially the same from the 1950s to the 2016 fish habitat and fish population surveys. Two thumbs up. Great news. Uh, it's a brief report. If you want it, I can email it to you. Do you like fishing? Are you an angler? Brook trout populations in higher elevation streams are not impacted by elevation until over 1,400 feet above mean sea level. Brook trout require colder water temperatures and so prefer smaller, higher elevation streams. And those are where there's the best breeding habitat. Stuff I learned in this job, I didn't know. All right, what can we do in Dummerston? Getting back to planting riparian buffers, preserve smaller, higher elevation streams, remove dams. We talked about that. Other barriers to aquatic organism passage. I didn't put on here. Leave the large green debris in the channel, it creates habitat. One of the pieces of the large green debris, they hide underneath it, and the raptors, the birds of prey, can't get out, they're protected. So this is a video that we show in the Rivers and Roads tree. I've counted, there's 24 fish in this video to try and make it up through six make. And it's only the biggest ones that make it. How big is that drop? How big is the drop? It looks like three feet, two and a half feet. Mm -hmm. The water turbulence going down, they use that, mm -hmm. they, sw <laughs> they swim from the side, they get into that water turbulence, and they use it as a boost to get through. <laughs> This is Smith Brook in Northern New Hampshire, 2007. This is where the Rivers and Roads program, the people that respond, this is great. This is, the dogs, like, what is it, what are <laughs> this is where they understand, okay, we need to bury the poem. We need to get it down to the water's edge. Oh, almost. Does it cost any more to build them in the right way in the first place? To build the cone in the right way in the first place, does it cost any more? All right, the question is if we build the culvert in the proper way the first time, does it cost any more? So, the only, if this were properly sized and it was excavated and put lower, the difference in the cost would have been that two and a half, three feet of more excavation. It's, it's a minimal cost increase. If you think about building a new road and putting in a properly sized structure, you're going to dig down from the existing grade, put the culvert in, and then build the road on top. So it doesn't cost any more in the new construction. It doesn't cost more. And I think you've got the idea of this. All right, so last year, in East Burke of the Northeast Kingdom, the Sumsec River Dam removal. And this took 20 years of talking to the community to get them to flip their mindset that, oh, this is a good thing, we should do this. So it was a dam that was built for 
hydropower for mills 100 years ago and failed in Irene. Mean, it was in a partial breach. Just by having the dam there, 16 feet tall, I believe, the flooding is reduced because there's the bottom, the channel is down 16 feet. It's just above the state highway bridge. So a lot of sediment had built up behind the dam. They didn't take all of that out. They removed 11,000 cubic yards of sediment. And people were worried that the swimming hole would go away. But they restored the swimming hole just at a lower elevation. If they had not removed the dam and the 11,000 cubic yards of sediment, this is what they formally wanted to do. They didn't want to take the dam out. So the consultant calculated that the amount of time that it would take for the 11,000 cubic yards that was removed, if they just kept the dam, took the sediment out to restore the depth of the water of the swimming hole. It would have been five years later that that 11,000 cubic yards would have filled in behind the dam. Because rivers and streams move water, sediment, and debris every second forever. And so that was the selling point. You know, if you leave the dam, you take out the 11,000 cubic yards, you're going to have to be back in here five years later and do it again. And that was the aha moment. Oh, wait a minute. What are we doing? We're wasting money. And I'm working with another town right now. And they have come to that conclusion. Because they had just two years ago dredged it out. And then in that, what was it, July 1st flood in 2017, it fell right back in again. <clears throat> so taking it out, they don't have that frustration with future costs. And there's a risk and liability. With dams, but <clears throat> as you said, the sediment continuously moves downstream, and it would fill up behind the dam. I've been to several towns where they routinely dredge because that is either part of their hydro system yeah. or swimming or whatever, and it's a expected cost. Are you saying that we shouldn't do it? We should do it, we should plan for it. I mean, what's, what's the state attitude towards that? Because I've been to several places that do it routinely. You had asked me this earlier at break, and I'd said it's a difficult, complex discussion. So, and it gets to Jan's comment about when you take out the dam, what's going on with the wetlands? the Eastburg Dam removal, the wetland complex that was there before, that was obvious in a, rec a historical records review. And the amount that had grown with the sediment that built up. And so these things, you know, they'll require federal, state, and local permits, and there could be eight, ten permits needed. Wetlands being one of them, state and federal wetlands. Getting back to, it wasn't there before. It was put in for social, political reasons. You know, there was a number of lumber mills up there that were powered by the dam that was here. And then that lumbering use, mill use, goes away. So it's soil. Now, you would think behind the dam it would be great fishing, but it's not. There's not enough habitat there. There's not enough food supply there. So there's no fish. No fishing there. And you, you're shaking your head. You know that they don't want to be there. There's no food. So then there's the public safety flood risk of leaving it in. Public safety is inherent in the Stream Alteration Law, Chapter 41, and in my mind, a human life trumps leaving the dam for wetlands. 
I don't know how uh, more succinctly put it than that. It's a whole slew of issues that get debated, and damn rules are usually taking a very long time. Adrian Bagatelle was happy to get rid of the dam. Where are we? There. Um, last year, because she didn't want the risk of liability, and she didn't even know it existed when she was shown it. Oh, take it out. I don't want the risk of liability. So, I don't know if that, that answers your question. It's a very... Like, like everything else, dams require periodic maintenance, and shouldn't that sediment removal be part of the routine maintenance? Okay. So, the ban on gravel extraction came out in 1978, because every time the town was made to gravel out, the upstream and downstream neighbors would complain to the legislators, hey, every time they do this, I got more erosion on my property. In the law, we permit gravel extraction. So, if somebody wants to come, a town, a dam owner, and remove the sediment behind the dam, we can permit that with conditions on how to do it properly. Any, all in-stream wet work results in a sediment discharge, and it's in the law, you got to minimize that sediment discharge, but recognizing that when you set up, it's called means and methods for bypass of water to control sediment. When you set it up at the beginning, there's a discharge. During the work period, it's clear. At the end, when you take it out, there's a discharge. But you're not working for six weeks with a constant muddy, muddy mess going on. And um, I don't know if that's the answer to you, but if someone has a facility, they've got the right to use that facility, to enjoy that facility. So we, we can't say to somebody, you know, this is just your woodshed, and we're not going to let you rip around this. That's taking away their rights. Yeah. And I'm, I'm getting the... Yeah, I'm getting it. Can you finish off? And... It's just, it's just, it's really good. Yeah. It's really, really that's, good. Really that's good. it. So... so. If, if we can do this, anybody who has questions can stick around as long as Todd's willing to stay. Yep. And, uh, and, but thank you, thank you, thank you very much.